Greetings, everyone. Welcome into another week, another week, another football game, another post-game recap show here on the Wolverine.com. Anthony Broom here, along with former Michigan defensive lineman Ryan Van Bergen, here to discuss as there's a giant fly just like buzzing around my head. Uh, love when that happens. Uh, we're going to discuss a 31-7 win over the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Big Ten play is underway. Jim Harbaugh back. We'll get to all of that here soon enough. I'll just run through the scoring rundown super quick here. Uh, Rutgers got on the board first at the 14-minute mark of the first quarter on a 69-yard touchdown pass from Gavin Wimsat to Christian Dremel to take an early 7-0 lead. And from there, it was all Michigan. 31 straight points to end this game. Blake Corum uh, scored his seventh touchdown of the season on a two-yard rush in the first quarter. Smaj Morgan with his the first career touchdown an 18 yard pass from JJ McCarthy in the second quarter, Michigan would go into the locker room at halftime up 14 to seven coming out of the locker room. Uh, Michigan would go on a 14 place, 62 yard drive that took almost eight minutes off the clock and got on the board with a James Turner, 46 yard field goal. That would leave things at 17 to seven. Uh, I believe it was the next drive. Uh, the very next defensive possession, Mike Sane was still, with probably the play, I won't say the play of his Michigan career. We all, we all know which one that was, but a 71-yard interception return for a touchdown on a screen pass played about as well as you can possibly play it. We'll talk about that here coming up. And then, of course, Blake Corum closes out the scoring in the fourth quarter, a five-yard touchdown run, nine plays, 66 yards for the Michigan offense to make the score 31-7, and that's how it would end uh, as both teams ran out the clock the rest of the way. So, uh, Ryan Van Bergen, welcome in. Uh just quick thoughts before we dive in on, on what we saw Saturday afternoon. I think we saw three quarters of really good football. Uh, I think the first quarter we got a little bit of a slow start and probably had some concerned Michigan alums and fans uh, as if you start that game and give up an explosive play, which we haven't seen this defense give up yet. But um, all in all, a really good sound performance. Definitely some things that you want to see improve and some things you want to clean up to play some of the top quality opponents here in the Big Ten. But to have our Big Ten opener and play this well, I think, and play this well through three quarters. A good performance, solid performance for Michigan. Solid is definitely the word, and I'm sure that will come up a lot today. Before we get into takeaways and diving in a little bit more from what we saw in this homecoming performance victory, I want to talk about and shout out our friends over at My Perfect Franchise. You guys have heard us talk about them throughout the football season, uh, dating back to, I believe, last winter when we start working. Uh, started working with Andy uh, and the rundown is this. Are you a displaced corporate executive or wanting to put your career in your own hands? Or are you an experienced entrepreneur wanting to diversify? Well, Andy Ludicky can help you. Andy is a huge college sports fan and franchise veteran having owned multiple franchises and businesses using his expertise. He helps others find their American dream through a very thorough consultation and evaluation process. So call Andy, put your life and career in your own hands. Best of all, this is the biggest perk of, of getting in contact with Andy. His services are 100% free to you, so you have nothing to lose. Get in touch with him today. Find out what opportunities you could get yourself into working with Andy and My Perfect Franchise. So head on over to MyPerfectFranchise.net. You can contact Andy at 404-973-9901 or head on over to MyPerfectFranchise.net. All right, Ryan, we'll dive in. Uh, we'll do offense, defense here in a second, but I want to start with this. Uh, you know, something we talked about a lot in our first three post game shows had to do with it seemed like there was a little juice that was missing at times without Jim Harbaugh on the field. And Saturday afternoon, again, now it, it the score very similar, another 31 7, 31 6. You know, we've seen this over the first few weeks, but it did feel like when it was time to make a play put your foot on the accelerator and get out of here with a victory. That's what they were able to do. And I like that we saw the starters play into the fourth quarter of this game. It's big 10 play. You want to get those guys some reps uh, playing deep into the game, but my goodness, uh, it felt like, again, not a perfect performance, but maybe that gear that we were looking for or a little more juice. It just felt like it was there today, a little bit more of a killer instinct at times. I think so. And I think Rutgers need, deserves a whole lot of credit. They came in and they punched us in the mouth to get the game going. And I think that they probably 
weren't expecting that. And I think that that kind of flipped the switch for the Michigan guys and they started playing better football. The first two series, both the first offensive, first defensive series, I thought both were pretty poor uh, for, for both squad, both units, but um, that wasn't the trend of the game. They got it turned around and they played a full football game after that. And I agree getting the starters out there for the remainder of the game and playing what feels like real, real football, that word that we kept using the preseason, the preseason's over. Yeah, and I want to I want to shout out Rutgers too. I mean, that is you know Greg Schiano has done an excellent job there of building, and we wrote about this this week. We talked about it this week. He's done a really good job of building a. And again, I'm not saying they're a threat to win the Big Ten East. I don't even know if they're going to make a bowl game, but they've built Big Ten quality depth on the offensive and defensive lines, namely up front on defense. They've got all Big Ten talent on their defense at all three levels. I thought those guys played extremely well and they're going to be a pain in the ass to play. They have been a pain in the ass to play and slowly, but surely the horses are kind of starting to match how well coached they are. So, you know, obviously want to give them their due. I thought, uh, you know, outside of, and I guess let's start on defense today because outside of that opening, opening drive, three plays, 75 yards, the 69 yard touchdown, which really I have to watch the replay. I believe both Rod Moore and Mike Sainer still tripped on the play. So a busted coverage there, but Outside of that, you know, you, you this was going to be a game where Gavin Wimsat in his career has never, you know, if you put the ball, you know, put the ball in his hands and make him try and beat you, that's usually something that goes pretty well for the other defense. And at times he played super well and their their wide receivers made some nice catches, some nice plays. But I think for the most part, mission accomplished. And it just, you, you hung in there, you made the critical play on that Mike Sainer was still interception. Uh, I thought Michigan's defense outside of that opening drive today was, was outstanding. I think so too. And even though we're saying opening drive, it was one play and it was a little bit of a fluke seemed like some sort of a fire zone uh, with McGregor. If McGregor gets a little more depth, who knows that ball doesn't get there. You know, center still is just a, just a step behind. It happens to be Rod Moore is playing in his first, you know, this is his first outing as far as I know since since we started this season. And it's his third play of 2023 and just doesn't keep his head up and ends up taking out Sanders still who would have limited the damage. So outside of that one play, defensively, we played really well. And they played really well offensively. Some of the plays that their receivers were making uh, on the sidelines and most throws where they're being placed, uh, they were playing their best football uh, on the Rutgers side of the ball. And although they were playing their best, not getting any results really uh, from the Michigan defense. So this is a defense that can keep people out of the end zone, can keep points off the board, and now is showing, you know, in game in, game out, we can generate turnovers. So all the things that you want to see from a defense against a quality, at, de- at least moderate at the very least, uh, moderate quality opponent, we saw those things today out of our defense. Yeah, and when you look at how Rutgers stacks up against the rest of the Big Ten, and maybe just the Big Ten East, I mean – I, I think I can say with confidence it's an offense that I think is better than Indiana. We'll see if it winds up being better than, you know, say a Michigan State. But uh, the run game is where they've really excelled this year. And uh, coming in today, uh, Wimsett had not thrown an interception yet. And there was a lot made about, oh, wow, he's really improved his accuracy. Then you go and you flip through the box scores, and he's only completing uh, 51% of his passes on the year. He actually competed, uh, completed 52% of it today. So even kind of a step up in that regard. But the rud wall to me, without Mason Grant, uh, who, if you guys missed it, had a thumb injury uh, last week. It looks like he's probably going to be on the shelf for a few weeks here. Kenneth Grant steps into uh, the starting nose tackle role and plays, I-, I thought, extremely well. 23 rushes for 77 yards uh, for Rutgers. And um, I'm sorry if I'm botching his name. Uh, Manen Guy, the guy, f- uh, the the running back from Rutgers, I think was the, the nation's, I know he was leading the Big Ten in rushing and you know, one of the better running backs in college football early on this season, 11 carries 27 yards. I mean, that was going to be, you know, if Rutgers was going to have a chance in this game, they were going to have to find ways to run the football. And Wimsat was going to have to kind of get this team into the, into the game with his arm. And, and early on, that was the case. But, you know, once water found its level, uh, another week where defense is around 250 yards of total offense. So just, I mean, run wall in general, speak to that, Ryan. I and mean, I thought those guys were, as good as, as they've been against a team that uh, is as good as they've played in that area to this point. Yeah, I think you, it's tough not to look ahead at the Michigan schedule and kind of circle some games that are going to be the games that are, that are going to determine the outcome of this season. And one of those games is in 
or at Penn State. And we haven't been tested, and there's not too much on our schedule that makes me think we're going to be tested mightily in the trenches, especially with a team that prefers to run the ball like you see out of a Rutgers. So for our front seven to come into this game and play the way that they did, again, in the with the absence of Mason Graham, I thought they played phenomenal. I was going to say it's rare that you say share a game ball, but if Sander still doesn't have that amazing play, I think game ball goes to anyone who put their hand in the dirt and played on the D-line this game. I know we didn't come away with any sacks. I think that's a product of the offense we were playing and the athlete that they had at quarterback. But defensively, we were very, very sound against a team that likes to run the ball and is has success running the football against other teams. So uh, that was a nice showing and something that gives me a lot of confidence as we move into Big Ten play. Yeah, Rutgers offensive coordinator Kurt Karoka is actually and used to coordinate at Penn State, used to coordinate at, at Minnesota, and has coordinated some really good offenses in this conference. And I thought that uh, it was another week where – Pass rush was offset by kind of the quick game and getting the ball out fast. Uh, but I thought those guys, for the most part, were still pretty disruptive overall. Uh, I'm kind of surprised you look at a guy like Josiah Stewart. We haven't seen more out of him. But, you know, every, it seemed like Jalen Harrell had another nice game. Brayden McGregor had a nice game. Uh, and, and obviously those interior guys did a really nice job stepping up uh, in the absence of Mason Grant. Uh, going through some more of the defensive notes here. Oh, of uh, a friend of mine said this during the game on the Mike Sainer still interception, and it kind of goes hand in hand with what we'll talk about on the offensive line. But uh, Kenneth Grant had an awesome block on Mike Sainer still's pick six. And a friend of mine said to me that uh, it's the best block that a player wearing the number 78 has made in this game today. So um, shout out to that half a game ball for that uh, to, uh, to Kenneth Grant. But I thought that was, uh, that was kind of funny. Um, Outside of the defense, I mean, yeah, these are outside of what we've discussed defensively. I don't have a whole lot else to add there. I mean, uh, it was nice to see Will Johnson back today. Rod Moore was out there knocking some rust off. Uh, you know, a couple plays here and there where you're like, gosh, you know, it would have been nice to at least see both of them a little more on a pitch count, maybe in non conference play if you were worried about them. But, uh, you know, if you're going to break the rust off in Big Ten play, a game against Rutgers is not the worst time to do it. Uh, but, I assume those guys will continue to look better week in and week out. Rod looked a little stiff today, but I I think that's just going to come with getting those game reps. I think so. And I mean, it's just a blessing that we've been able to have these guys get healthy and the people that have been out there in their stead has been just as good and don't notice that they're, you know, that we're missing starters. So uh, that's really solid. I mean, our depth on the defense is, probably one of our greatest strengths. I feel like we have guys too deep at every position without really losing much, you know, and that's rare. And that's something that I feel like is something that, especially as you get later into the big 10 season is going to be a huge factor into how uh, successful and productive our defense is. Yeah. And, and again, just putting the ball on the whole defensive thing. Uh, it was nice to, nice to turn them over. I know that's something that's been an emphasis for them. Again, Mike Sager still played that the screen about as well as you could to the point where I don't think, I think the big reason that thing wound up going for six was the fact that it was so, he looked like he was the only guy that knew it was going on. And that's, that's just kind of how Mikey plays in general, but man, oh man, uh, good stuff uh, on the defensive side of the ball outside of the 69 yard touchdown, just a sterling day at the office for the most part. So Things to clean up for sure. You want to see them get a little more pressure. You want to see them be a little more disruptive from the edges, I guess. But, you know, you play a running quarterback. And it feels like this program hasn't defended a running quarterback consistently well since, I don't know, the 1940s or something like that. But uh, um, good day at the office for those guys. Let's flip over to the offensive side of the ball. Last week, the big storyline was J.J. McCarthy throwing the three interceptions and Again, not perfect. I, he was a little shaky early on in this one. Michigan went three and out on its first drive of the game, but he finishes the day 15 for 21, 214 yards, a touchdown to Samaj Morgan on. And I want to give Samaj Morgan a shout out too. That's one of the best adjustments to a, a ball that I've seen a Michigan wide receiver play, uh, make regardless of class in the last few years. So shout out to him. He looks like he's going to be a player. We also saw him uh, out there on kickoffs as well. A little bit of adventure there, but uh, we'll give him credit for his first career touchdown. But overall, McCarthy, nice day. Uh, Also, I thought as decisive and as quick with his reads in terms of 
nothing's there. It's time to get on my horse and run. And they had a few design runs too, but a lot of what he did with his legs on Saturday was improvisational and smart, heady plays by him. Seven attempts, 51 yards. What did you make of JJ's performance, Ryan? I thought he came out a little rough. I think he had one ball, his first ball out to Loveland. It was just an easy pitch and catch on an out route that if he throws it, you know, low and away from the defense, it's an easy catch. He runs with it, gets tackled after five, 10 yards. Um, and he throws it inside and the defense uh, gets a chance to knock that down. And, you know, those are the type of throws that we were not used to seeing him make through the first two games, three games. And, uh, you know, that's something that we were wondering, are we going to see JJ be as sharp as he has been? And I think just like the rest of the team after that first series, I feel like he was pretty sharp. Like you said, I think the one thing that stuck out to me was his decisiveness, especially when it came to running the football. It was nice to see that that was a wrinkle that was part of our offensive game plan this week. And I thought it was well executed, thought it was a great game plan to get JJ running without risking taking hits. And that's what I think you need to do with the JJ McCarthy and to keep the defense honest when you've got Donovan Edwards and Blake Corum, both his other rushing options. So uh, I thought after that first series, he looked really sharp, took care of the football, managed the offense very well. I think that's the key managing the offense. Uh, and again, I want to Rutgers, uh, like I said, uh, Greg Schiano's done a great job of adding talent to this team uh, on, on defense. Like I said, they've got, They've got a couple all co- uh, all conference caliber guys at each level. Uh, Aaron Lewis, also a guy that Michigan fans would be familiar with. Uh, a brief stint in Ann Arbor before transferring home to be uh, with his mother. But uh, again, we knew they were going to load up to stop the run. That's what everyone's done so far. That's what everyone will continue to do. And at times, frustrating that the offensive line can't get a little more of a push. But also, you know, you've got that extra ten- attention. You've got that extra guy in the box. I thought that I think it was on Michigan's second drive. There was, uh, you know, as creative as creative of play calling as we've seen so far this year. There was the, uh, you know, there's the pass where Donovan Edwards just kind of leaks out of the backfield and he's wide open with nothing but green grass in front of him. There was a flea flicker down to Colston Loveland. Uh, another another nice play for him. Colston Loveland, Michigan's leading receiver on the day. Five catches, 75 yards. Really nice grab. I think it was in the third or the fourth quarter, too, where he kind of has to extend out and make a play. And uh, He continues to impress. But uh, this run game in general, uh, Blake Corum, you look at the timeshare with the snaps here. 21 carries for Blake Corum. We've talked about the seven for McCarthy already. Kalel Mullings and Donovan Edwards both had six carries. Now, most of Mullings' work came at the end of the, the game when they were trying to ice the game and uh, run the clock down. But, you know, to me, and it, it's kind of been building to this over the first three weeks, but once again, it just remains, it, it be, it, it's even more clear to me that Blake Corum is this team's lead back. And 21 carries, 97 yards, two more touchdowns. He's got eight on the season. What do you make of this Michigan run game through four uh, four weeks, and then specifically today, how they performed? I actually really enjoyed the later fourth quarter series where we ran power six times in a row, seven times in a row, just to continue to move the ball down the field and just execute what we want to execute, regardless of what they do with how many guys are in the box and what they're doing uh, against us. And we were under center a lot and we had guys pull in, we had good double teams and we didn't really show up and hasn't shown up the way we thought it would for the first four games. And I, I honestly think it was kind of more of the same uh, through the first half, at least of this football game that, you know, we're just not getting our backs to the second level as cleanly or as often as I thought we would. And I think a lot of us are all in that same boat when we look at this offense, because we have the veterans, we have the veteran backs. We have three of the five O line back. We've got some good grad transfers in there. It really just doesn't make sense. Doesn't compute. Why can't we get these guys broken free a little bit? And I think part of it is, yeah, they're loading up the box, but I think part of it is schematics. I think we need to get back to where we have a great variety of trap and pulling guys and zones and end arounds and things that so people can't queue up and be like, all right, it's going either between guard tackle, tackle tight end. Here we go. Those, that's where we're focused. And um, I thought you saw a little bit more in the bag of our running game attack, but I think that that's something that maybe we're holding close to the vest. Now that we're getting into big 10 play, we start to open up and reveal a little bit of our cards and what we want to do with the run game. But um, it's been very vanilla and very meh. And I feel like today there was a little bit more than meh. 
Yeah, slightly more than meh would be uh, <laughs> how we. I think we'll we'll put that in the stat book for how that one goes down. Um, I don't want to keep harping on this, but I I'm starting to get just a little bit worried about Donovan Edwards in that that gear just is not there right now. Everything you know, it, it looks slow. You know, coming out of the backfield, um, you know, setting up for for carries and. Um, he's just not going anywhere and doesn't really fight for a ton of contact. And th- that's where I, I start to wonder like what, uh, and especially you see Mullings come out. I mean, Kalel Mullings ran as hard and with as much juice as any of those backs on the field did Saturday afternoon. I just wonder what that timeshare starts to look like, because if you're going to bring, like you bring Edwards in and, and in an ideal situation, he's a guy where, okay, well, he can run the ball just as good as Blake Corum can, and then, but he can also catch the ball. So how do we defend this? How do we do this? But, you know, right now I have to think that when teams see him line up in the backfield as Michigan's lone running back, there's just not a whole lot to be afraid of right now. I would agree, and I, I am stumped, and I wonder is there, you know, maybe a health issue that we're not being made aware of. And I can understand them not making us aware of it. They wouldn't want opponents to know that he's not 100%, but something just looks off. Uh, Something looks off. He doesn't look as sudden and as twitchy and even as powerful. I mean, I remember times where Donovan Edward meets somebody in the hole and it doesn't matter if it was a linebacker, like Donovan Edwards, you better get some help because that linebacker is not going to get him down on his own. And now you see Donovan Edwards getting into the sideline and turning down hits. You know, it's just uh, at one point I was making jokes week one, week two, that all right, those are career moves. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But at this point, these aren't career moves anymore. This is uh, this is a guy that just doesn't seem like he's got that same 100 uh, percent ceiling that he ended last year with. And, you know, I still believe it's there. He's got the athleticism. So I wonder about his health. And then I just wonder about mindset. And like you said, if he gets less reps, what's going to happen then? But uh, this is a guy that has to get the football. He's so explosive, such a good player. There's no way you can stop giving this guy touches because he's going to produce at some point. I have to believe. Yeah. And I think it's, we talk about often how, you know, how do you get a quarterback into a rhythm? You know, you get him a few easy ones. He pops a big play and all of a sudden uh, it seems like JJ kind of came alive today when he had, after one of his quarterback runs. And, you know, I wonder if, and the play design where Donovan, like I said, there was the one play where, uh, you know, he just kind of leaks out of the backfield uh, or it's actually, I had this in the notes too. I, I liked I like what they're doing right now with some of the pre-snap motion stuff. There's a lot of creative looks that they've come up with out of that. It got, it's gotten Roman Wilson open a few times. It got Donovan Edwards open on one of his receptions today. Um, you know, it feels like they need to, they need to get some easy ones for him. And right now, I mean, I, I, I have no doubts that there's still some rust being, sh- I mean, we forget he's shaking off an off season knee surgery too. And obviously had some other stuff with the hand, but um, I feel like they need to scheme a scheme away to just get him more towards green grass because the pounding in between the tackles, it's just, it's just going nowhere right now. And if Kalel, if Kalel Mullings is running that way between the tackles and now, and then you have those two guys, uh, Corum and Edwards playing to what their potential is. Suddenly it does kind of take a different shape because it kind of turns into a three headed monster here, but uh, got to get some easy ones for Donovan. I think it's a confidence thing right now. He just doesn't seem as decisive and you know, he's not putting his foot in the ground and getting up field. It's just moving really slow. So I was just going to com- comment on that too, that like, I feel like they gave him one chance and I was, you know, remember this play because it was one of those that made me kind of scratch my chin and go, what's up with that? Like that first, or I'm sorry, the second drive, you were talking about the two trick plays and they got him some green grass on the Michigan sideline and he's running down the sideline. He's got 15 yards of green grass in front of him and two defenders kind of barn down, but they've got some distance. And I watched him make the decision of I'm taking this out. And that's not what Donovan Edwards used to do. He used to get limited touches. He wanted to prove himself. He wanted to be that dog that, you know, wanted to prove that he should be getting the same amount of carries and touches as Corm because I can do as much with this football. And when I watched him turn down the opportunity to go see if he can make two guys miss and make the real highlight play, he didn't want it. And I don't know why, again, because that's not the same mindset that he used to approach that exact same play with a year or two ago. I'm not advocating for this, but, uh, at times, it looks like he's running to avoid a hit or running to avoid that contact. I almost feel like maybe a, a big hit comes, and that's kind of like, okay, I took it. I can handle it. Like, let's 
let's get this thing going moving forward. But uh, we'll see. Obviously, it needs to be better there, but I see no reason to, you know, if it's going to take 20, 25, 30 carries out of Blake Corum to win football games and move the football, so be it. I, I think I'm at peace with that at this point. So uh, offensive line, still kind of doing this derby with the offensive tackles. I kind of thought after we saw them make that lineup switch, I believe late in the third quarter of last week's game, with Ladarius Henderson on the left side, Carson Barnhart on the right. I thought that would be the look that we got this week, uh, but Miles Hint was starting at right tackle. Carson Barnhart was back on that left side, and at some point uh, they did need to make that switch again today. Uh, there was a third down play. I think it was down in the red zone. It was right before Turner's 46-yard field goal where, uh, I mean, both tackles got got creamed on this third down play, but uh, – Again, Hinton just kind of continues to be a turnstile there. And they went back to Henderson and Barnhart. And I, it's been four games. I think I'm ready to just let them ride that combo out and see what happens. Uh, because Miles Hinton, the play on the field is not matching what you would hope to see from a guy who's 6'6, 340. Uh, I kind of feel like this was, this was maybe a turning point there, but I thought that would happen last week too. I, yeah, and I think that Ladarius Henderson is somebody that I feel like when you watched, at least in when he got significant reps in this game, he's consistently getting double teams and getting combo blocks that uh, are opening up some bigger holes and are getting into the second level. He's not getting stalemated on the line of scrimmage. Uh, for whatever reason, we used to see Hinton uh, on multiple occasions, you know, not getting his own heels off the line of scrimmage. And I feel like physically the guy is gifted. I mean, look at him. You can't tell, tell me that that guy is not able to move some some big bodies and create space. But for whatever reason, it just hasn't happened. And then in pass pro, I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. He gave up at least one pressure, and then he gave up a sack. And I think after that, it was time to make a, make a, ch make a change. You know, you, you, if you're not going to help us in the run game, and you're also a liability in the pass game, we've got to try something. And I think Ladarius Henderson is that answer. I feel like he played well in the reps that he had today. And I agree with you. We need to get something solidified. And then, like I said, I'd like to see us get into some more schematic style of running and varying schematic style of running and see if we can change up some blocking schemes and keep defenses guessing and uh, continue to see Corum and hopefully Edwards, you know, get loose. And don't get me wrong. I think Barnhart has Barnhart hasn't played super. Yeah, I don't think he's played all that well at left tackle, but he's not a left tackle. He's a right tackle, and that's where his best spot was last year. That's where I think that if you can just make that switch permanent, I think a lot of the things that have ailed him early on this year are going to fix itself just by playing in a more comfortable spot. And Ladarius Henderson was brought here uh, to compete not just compete for this left tackle job to go out and win it. And I know there was some hesitation because he didn't quite win it outright out of, or he didn't win it out of camp. Carson Barnhart outperformed him, but I think this is their best combo right now. I think Henderson on the left side, Barnhart on the right. Uh, Nugent has, you know, you want to see a little more push in the middle, but Trevor Keegan, I think hasn't played super well. Zach Sinter has, has kind of been the only constant there, but it takes five guys and, you know, Heading into this week, it's week five. It's week, you know, whatever is nine weeks, whatever it's been since fall camp started. You're going on the road in this conference the next two weeks. And, and there's no, you go on the road. I don't care if it's Nebraska. I don't care if it's Ohio State. I don't care who it is. You go on the road in this conference and you're rotating tackles and you don't have, um, you know, you're not solid in that area yet. Teams are going to, you know, that's going to be a problem for you when you go on the road especially when it comes to communication and chemistry. So I think this is the week to make that switch permanent. I thought that would happen last week, but it didn't. Uh, but also, again, you know, we talk about how maybe didn't run the ball quite as much as you wanted to, and, and the pass pro was was hit or miss on Saturday. Again, I will hammer home. This Rutgers defense is, is really, really good. Uh, they're, they're well coached. Those guys are swarming to the ball. They tackle well. Uh, you don't see them make a ton of mistakes or a ton of the big mistakes. This isn't Chris Ash's uh, Rutgers anymore. Um, again, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're a bowl team or going to compete for the Big Ten East. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not making excuses. It's just you played a good Big Ten defense on Saturday and for the most part, I would say, controlled the game. I would say that, and I agree with you. I was actually thinking that same thing as far as 
road games are coming and road games are something that I feel like this team has enjoyed a very cushy and very comfortable September here in Ann Arbor, but uh, it's tough to win on the road. There's a lot of, it depend, and a lot of times it, you're probably playing a team that, uh, you know, in Nebraska who you're supposed to beat and probably going to be favored by double digits in their place. And you still could end up in a dog fight. And, you know, one of the things that I actually was thinking about and wondering, you know, wouldn't, watching this game is I think there may be a dynamic uh, on the offense that could be something that bites us if we were not aware of it and something that, uh, you know, we wouldn't know unless you're a player, but I feel like we've talked last week about there being such a big significant step down. If we were to happen to lose JJ and who comes in in his relief and our one to two, there's, there's a big drop off there. And defensively, I don't think we have this because we've got some interchangeable guys, but offensively, I feel like your preparation's a little bit different. JJ got his start competing against McNamara and trying to get this spot. So everything mattered. Every throw mattered. The placement mattered. The timing mattered. All those things mattered. Uh, Corm and Edwards were battling at one point before they were lightning and lightning to try and get some carries and, and try to get their own highlights and see if they both can get to a thousand yards, you know, and, Part of me thinks, and I might eat my words for saying this, but part of me thinks we've gotten a little bit too cushy, a little bit too chummy, and a little bit too secure. You know, J.J. McCarthy throws some bad balls. What's going to happen to J.J.? Nothing. He's going to be out there. Blake Corum fumbles. What's going to happen? Nothing. He's going to get touches, you know? And I think that that's a dynamic of this offense, especially as you go on the road, that might show up and be ugly that we haven't had to compete for these spots. We, every rep doesn't matter that as much as it used to. And, you know, it takes maturity to realize that you're in that situation and recognize it and then not allow it to impact your team. So we'll only find out when they get down on the road and see if they have to actually score and come from behind. This is the first time we didn't lead in a football game so far, 2023. So, um, but as I was thinking about that, it could be a real thing. I could be making it up in my head, but it could be a problem as we get on the road and get into October. Yeah, it's been the performances so far have been workmanlike, but they're you're right. They're, that grit has is kind of been missing from them. There's a there's a fight. There, there's a fire. There's a a hunger that hasn't I feel like hasn't quite been there yet. And again, I wrote this in my notes too as something I wanted to talk about. You know, you want this team to peak in November, not necessarily September. We've seen that before. Uh, and even when you go and look back, I mean, this is week four now. You go back and look at the last two week four performances two years ago in this building. You needed a fumble late, or you needed Rutgers to fumble late to hold off an upset from them in this building. Uh, last year, same deal. Week four, Maryland comes in here and gives you a pretty good game. And we're sitting here again talking about things to clean up and things that need to get better and an extra gear that needs to be hit. And we're talking about a you know a 24-point win over Rutgers, which is Michigan's first cover of the year, by the way. Um, so for the gambling folks out there, shout out to you. But yeah, I, it's... I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see this team's counterpunch, and to a certain extent, we saw it today. But you know, if Rutgers or if uh, Nebraska goes up early, Minnesota goes up early in the next few weeks, I think you're going to learn a lot about this football team. Uh, there's just something, something there that's missing to this point. And I don't know if it's it's good health for everyone. I don't know if it's completely firing on all cylinders. But again, it's third week in a row where we're we're up here after a multi-score performance and quite frankly, there were points left on the field and you could be better and you nitpick it and you, you analyze it and you see where you can clean up. But uh, again, all of these things, I, there's nothing I've seen from this team yet this year that feels like, you know, a glaring deficiency. Now, four weeks in a lack of offensive line clarity is starting to be a bigger question mark than I thought it would be. Uh, you know, the usage of, you know, the dynamic between, between Corm and Edwards is maybe a little bit more of a question mark than I thought it would be, but overall, you know, it's hard to, you know, you're four. No, you've been mostly dominant. No one in college football looks truly dominant right now. And you just got to keep working at it and, and see what happens from there. So uh, we will get to your guys' questions here. We'll, we'll lead with Shane Johnson here in just a moment, uh, who has a four ninety nine super chat. Again, if you want to move yourself to the front of that line, feel free to use that donate button below. But before we do that, I want to talk about our friend Susie Surma over at Modus Realty. Uh, we have a new sponsor. You heard her last week on the post game podcast, but uh, sponsor this week, Susie, uh, Susie Surma, as we head into the question segment, uh, are you ready to buy a home? This is one of, if not the most expensive purchases you'll ever make and having a realtor who listens and cares about your needs. is crucial. 
Susie Surma is the right local expert for you if you're in Michigan or in the Ann Arbor, Detroit area. Susie includes a free buyer's consultation to uncover your home buying needs, maximizing experience and efficiency. Email her today at Susie at modusre.com. Let's face it, the market has been challenging for buyers. The critical piece that you might be missing, though, is having the right agent and having a realtor that has superior knowledge and negotiation skills is a key to closing on the home of your dreams. And Susie Serma is the answer for that. So not only does she know the area, she's a fierce negotiator. She's going to get you the best deal possible. She's going to set you up for success in your home buying search. So why not build equity now? Contact Susie Serma to start your customized home search today. You can call Susie at 248-767-5633 or email her at susie at modusre.com. That's M-O-T-U-S-R-E.com. So thank you to Susie Serma for being a wonderful sponsor and a partner for us. Uh, as promised, we will lead off questions this week with Shane Johnson with a 499 super chat here on YouTube for those of you watching live. He says a lot to work on, but proud of the boys. Number one scoring in total defense. Nice bounce back game for JJ and love him getting out of bounds. Hope Henderson won the job. So would you like to tackle all of those points, Ryan? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, our defense is something that I feel like isn't get, getting the nation, national credit that it deserves. I mean, we I would like to argue, I know we're the number one scoring in defense, but is there anyone else that only has given up one touchdown? I don't know if we can have anyone crunch that, but uh, I think that that's good if you're four games in and you've only given up one touchdown, at least, you know, to my knowledge, that's they good have football. Given up, I think it's two. They gave up they one up? against UNLV late. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm thinking it's field yep. goals. Um, yep. But, but regardless, I mean, the way that this team has been able to keep other teams off the board, and honestly, I mean, at one point I remember being a crazy stat, I think it was a home opener, that they hadn't crossed midfield once before halftime or something. So this is a good defense, and when you have a good defense, you've got a chance in a lot of games. So, uh, And I think we've got some really good playmakers on offense that we just haven't seen, haven't seen all that they can do just yet, and ha having seen some glimpses of what they're capable of, and what this team could be. Uh, I think we're all just excited to see four quarters of offense, defense, special teams operating sharp. And I agree with you. I'm, I'm team Henderson. Yeah. Uh, JJ, definitely nice job getting out of bounds. Need to need to do that. He has to stay healthy. It's imperative. And he also needs to know that he can slide. He does not need to dive head first into contact when he's running at the middle of the field, but uh, he's a gamer man and he's a hockey player. And I know that, that's a narrative that might be a little overblown at this point, but uh, you know, again, 265 total yards on the day. Can't really complain about what you got out of QB one. Uh, let's go to nerd bill. I love the name nerd bill it says Hinton versus Henderson competition for starting tackle still ongoing after this game. Yeah. I mean, I know they're, they want to do the, you have to earn it in practice type thing. And my takeaway is that miles Hinton must be the greatest practice offensive lineman of all time because mind you he's going up against michigan's defensive line when they practice and they scrimmage and they do those types of things so yeah i i mean at, at some point to me this is where i think just kind of going with your gut trusting your gut i, I know they they want to give him every chance they've wanted to give him every chance to win that job but ladarius henderson was a guy that i think had a shrine bowl invite last year before he uh, you know, one of those all-star games he had an invite for and obviously didn't go, decided to transfer to Michigan. He was brought here with the idea that he was going to be your starting left tackle. And I know that he didn't play in spring ball. Uh, he was kind of still catching up in fall camp. But, you know, at this point, I, I think you need to ride that out and see what happens. I, I do. And if you have to go back to the other guy at some point, so be it. But, you know, to me, it's clear that there needs to be a lot something's not translating from practice to game day for miles Hinton. And if you're not going to, you know, he already hasn't been run blocking well, but if you can't pass protect either, you can't be out there because then you just become a six foot, 340 pound turn style. So I don't know if that, I mean, I guess technically the battle could be ongoing, but I really hope that next weekend when this team takes the field in Lincoln, that Ladarius Henderson left tackle Carson Barnhart, right tackle, because no matter which way you draw it up, I think on paper that has a chance to be your best five. You can't, 
it's getting a little too late in the year to start crossing your fingers and hope someone figures it out. I think so. And this could be a little cliche for your for response for your answer, but I think the competition, my point is the competition needs to be ongoing for the entire season. And yes, there will be a starter, but these are guys that need to compete to maintain this job game in game out practice in practice out because that's how high the level of competition needs to be at a successful program and i think to your point i want to see henderson at left tackle and barnhart at right tackle i'd like to see them commit to you know the first half this is our guy these are our guys in nebraska unless something barring something crazy happens we're gonna see how we ride this out and see how it goes and then making an evaluation from there but i think ladarius henderson has done enough just in this game specifically and uh, Miles Hinton has had his opportunities. So even if it ends up being that you want to make a switch after this next game, I think it's time to see what is the combo starting with uh, Henderson left, Barnhart right tackle. What does that yield offensively? Because this season, I mean, game, this game, we had what three and out first drive, I'm not saying it was either of those guys' faults, but let's see what happens if we mix it up and, and what the, uh, what the outcome may be. <laughs> Uh, this one's from Vince S who asks any updates on Mike Sainer still. I read on Twitter that he limped off at one point late in the game. Yeah. He went to the medical tent. It was sometime after his pick six. I don't remember if again, uh, the end of the game stuff gets a little foggy when you're starting to set up post game things. And, and yeah, I mean, he had his, he came out of the injury tent. His helmet was off. They probably just told him you're done for the day. I don't get the sense I, again we didn't know that Mason Graham was injured until early last week after the Bowling Green game. So things could always happen after the game, but you know, in the here and now, not a whole lot of concerns about Mike Sainer still, but obviously, I mean, what we can speak to is again, it's just so hard to believe that he played wide receiver two years ago. I mean, he is, I think you can make the case that he might be, in the here and now this defense's best player. And that's saying something because they have a lot of guys at all three levels. Yeah. And he's one of the best players at a position that doesn't typically get a whole lot of love. I mean, the nickel position is a very difficult position when you're covering the slot, at least when you're on the edges. And again, coming from a defensive lineman, so I have tons of experience, but uh, when you're on the edges, you've got the sideline to help you out and can act as another defender. That entire boundary can help you. But when you're at the nickel, you're following guys on crossing routes, or maybe they're hitting you with a zag where they go in, then come back out. Your coverage is a lot more challenging in the nickel position. And Sanders still is just natural and just gifted. And I think he's going to be special at the next level too, because I feel like at the next level, that's what everybody's got a lockdown corner, maybe a good safety, but that nickel position, if you're special at the nickel position, you can be a game wrecker. And I think that's what you're seeing from him. And, you know, honestly, part of me sits back here and goes, maybe he should get 10 touches or five touches after watching him take that thing 75 yards. Can he, can he return kicks? Do we want him out there? Uh, obviously we want him healthy for defense, but there, there's something special about the way that kid plays football, whether it's offense or defense or special teams, he's just a special ball player. He's always in the right place at the right time. Uh, instincts off the charts. I mean, there might be aspects of his game at times. Maybe he could tackle a little bit better, but he is just so well-rounded there. And it's another, again, uh, Jim Harbaugh has, you know, he's, I don't know if he's quite batting a thousand on position switches that he's had a gut feel for, but that might be his best one to this point uh, at Michigan. So yeah, Mikey's played extremely well. Uh, this one's from Mr. Dave, a 798 super chat. What's your breakdown of the Rutgers touchdown play? Was it just a fluke? What did Michigan do to fix it? Uh, Ryan, what did you see there? Sorry. What was the question? I got my uh, screen thing in front of it. Yeah. It's... Oh, oh, yeah. So we're running a fire zone. It's a first third down. We haven't seen this as far as I know. I haven't seen this fire zone before. And it's kind of an interesting fire zone because it does look like maybe they go to man right away after they kind of dispatch to their zones. They kind of match because um, Sainer still looked like he was in phase like a man concept. Um but Rod Moore was playing free safety. He had no responsibilities besides deeper than the deepest. And then McGregor, um, as he dropped out of there, he kind of, you know, watch him just kind of not get off the line. If he goes with a little more depth, that quarterback might rethink that throw or he might hold it for another second. And then that way Rod Moore can be there. So it was a combination of, I think, McGregor not getting enough depth in his drop. Sanders still is a half step behind, which he typically is not. And then Rod Moore, this is his third play of – 2023 and he comes in and puts his head down actually ends up taking out Sanders still doesn't make a wrapped up tackle and you know that's the result so definitely yeah I guess the answer short answer is yes it was a fluke um but you know the 
it's a fluke that cost is six points. So you can't have those type of things in the Penn state game in the Ohio state game. So something to make sure we don't do again, but I think it was a combination of comical errors almost. Uh, this question is from, I'll just go to this one quickly from Rick Mahler who says, maybe the good news is that Donovan has to come back for a senior year. See, this is, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take you down here, Rick. Uh, my issue with comments like this is that people will tell a guy, I see it happen with Michigan basketball all the time. They'll say that a guy sucks and is playing terrible, but then, oh, well, maybe the good news is he comes back next year now. And it's just like, I just need you to play better. Like, I, I, I'm not worried about next year. I need you to play better. So uh, just yeah. addressing that one quickly. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have a and strong I, opinion on that. I would also just say, like, if Corum ends up not being healthy, which at some point it sounds like he would be, I think that might be the best thing that happens to Donovan Edwards is, all right, we need you to take it 25, 30 times, you know, and just just bang it and and get used to getting physical and running the football and not looking for home runs because you're getting another touch. And um, I, we need Donovan Edwards to be good for us this year. I mean, I order, I'm yeah. not worried about next year either. Yeah, and – if there's any, I'm not saying he is thinking this way, but if there's any of him that's worried about what his next year looks like, uh, need to get that out of your head too. The one thing, I'll, the last point of Donovan Edwards is, it's kind of a, it's kind of a rough spot to be in because so often he has been a guy who, he's kind of a volume guy that gets going the more touches that he has, but when every touch you have is again, he had a run for eight yards today, but other than that. Uh, five rushes on the five other five yards on the five other carries that he had. Uh, I'm not, I can't just let that guy figure it out and get into rhythm. When I have a guy like Blake Corum who I know, okay, maybe this play might not go anywhere, but I know he's going to put his shoulder down and get a couple more yards out of it. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with him throughout the year. Uh, Long-term I'm not worried about it, but right now kind of going, got, you know, kind of going through something. So uh, I have room in here for a few more, so feel free. Last call for questions. Have a couple more in the queue. This is a comment from Ed P, who says, a win is a win, but I don't think they look impressive anywhere. There are flashes, yes, but there are also lapses everywhere. They just don't look dialed in. Maybe Roman Wilson is the only guy. I don't know that I... I certainly agree with there are lapses in a lot of different areas in different times, but you know, at times they have looked impressive throwing the football. I think the pass protection for the most part has been pretty good this year. I think the wide receivers and tight ends have caught the ball fairly well. Defensive line has played well. Defense has, has been outstanding. So yeah, a lot of, there've been lapses and things to clean up, but uh, again, Ryan thoughts on that. I think we got a question in a little bit, what your they means, because I would argue that the defense is playing championship style football. Um, uh, there's been times and plays that aren't great, but very few of them. And if you think you're going to go out there and have any platoon execute with a hundred percent accuracy, efficiency, and you're not going to have a single play that didn't go in your favor. I've never seen a football game that goes that way. And if it did, it wouldn't be that entertaining. So uh, I, I think that the defense is playing championship level football. And I think the offense has shown that they can. And I think that's one of the things that we kind of have to sit back as Michigan fans and consider is that, you know, we're, we're concerned and we're nitpicking because they didn't play up to their potential. But this year is one of the only years that I can remember besides maybe 2006 where preseason the potential was national champion. And it's not just hype that comes from nowhere. We've been to the college football playoff. We're back-to-back Big Ten champions. These guys are all returning. This is the year. And so when we don't play up to that high bar of national champion, we think, oh, this team's not where – they don't have it. This is still a really good football team. They're going to be a really good football team. It's just a matter of are they going to hit that true potential, which is one of the highest marks you know that, you can, that they've ever hit. And – you know, we're all sitting here waiting, hoping that they do, but there's been times where it doesn't look like they're going to get there. And that's the concern, but they're still winning football games. Yeah. Uh, and I love this. This is maybe a good point to end on uh, from Dave Witt, who says maybe some fans should tune in after a few more weeks and save themselves some heartburn. Remember 2021 with a team that ascended throughout the year and escaped Nebraska and Penn state. And yeah, you're going to have those games. You're going to have, and Michigan hasn't had one yet. Uh, they've left some potential on the on the field for sure. But we talked about this earlier. This was their best week four performance in a few years. Uh, it was mostly dominant. Uh, again, there no game is no game is without its lapses for sure. And I think there are times where the 
uh, the lay person or the average fan will see that you're playing Rutgers and go, this is a team we beat 78 to zero in 2016. Why is this game as quote unquote close as it is? But you know, you, you, you tip your hat to the other side too. That's the best opponent that Michigan's seen so far this year by far. I mean, it's, that's not a hot take and, and you handled them and you played fairly well, but again, it is, it is a climb. It's a steady climb. And at some point, you know, if we get to week seven or eight and the offensive line doesn't look good still, and Donovan Edwards is still, you know, falling down at the line of scrimmage basically. And, and there's not enough juice in the run game and okay. Yeah. We'll start having the conversation, but really week five and week six over the last few years has really been where we've seen this team start to hit its stride. And maybe it takes a little bit longer this year just because of the Harbaugh stuff. But I, I, I don't feel strongly either way about this team after four weeks. I know what the potential is, but I don't see anything that registers as a concern. And I'm not seeing anything to go, wow, like they're the team to beat. But I think a lot of teams are kind of figuring that out still. I would also say that the mindset of this team and the way that this year, this season is shaping up is this team, I can't wait for them. This is going to sound crazy and I might eat these words too, but I can't wait for this team to be down by two scores on the road this team being Michigan and all right, let's go try and win a football game. Cause right now you're seeing a team that is trying to make sure no one gets hurt and don't lose. That's what we've been seeing for three weeks, four weeks. And I can understand that mindset, even if it's not admitted the mindset that's subconsciously how there there's has to be at least in the back of their heads, this approach. And I can't wait to see this team hungry and going out to try and win a football game. You will see a different gear like we've been talking about. And I think you'll see this team play differently when that's the case. Um, so I, I think every now and again, you just got to sit back and be patient and be thankful that you're winning every game by 20 points, because this team is, you know, this is the first lead we haven't, uh, the time we haven't had a lead is game four and we got went and got that lead tied up pretty quick. So I'm excited to see what this team does when they need to go hunt and go get a win in enemy territory and um, see what this team's really about. Cause we just don't know. Last one here for, uh, from uh, paint. Sorry, I can't read your username for some reason. Uh, painter baller or something like that. Uh, would you like to, s- who would you like to see get a chance returning punts? Is it Donovan Edwards? Uh, is it, who, who is that guy? Uh, for me, may, maybe if he's only going to get seven or eight carries, maybe that's how you get him a little more confidence with the ball in his hands. Uh, again, I still have my doubts this Jake Thaw thing will last. We saw Tyler Morris again on Saturday. Uh, did we see Samaj Morgan? No, Say, that Samaj, was a kickoff. He had one, I thought, or was it just a punt? I think that was the, the opening kickoff of the second half, and that was kind of an adventure too. But, um, yeah, I... I I don't know. Uh, I, I think who would I like to see? It's no disrespect to the young man, but anyone other than Jake Thaw, I'm not blaming what happened to him, you know, anything that happened today on him, but you want to see one of those scholarship guys with a little juice to their game. Uh, get out, get out there with the ball in their hands. We talk about green grass, uh, get out there, run, make a play, flip field position. Uh, instead of a guy who is just kind of, looking up and then just waving his arm and that's where the play is. So I don't know. Do you have a strong opinion on that? I don't. I mean, I just, I'd like to see someone who emerges as a playmaker. Cause if not, I'm, I'm on the other side of the coin, just to get the ball to your offense, fair catch it every single time. Don't worry about any returns. Just stop the ball and don't let them pin us too deep. And we'll <laughs> forego trying to advance the ball via punt return. You know, it's a high risk scenario. Anyway, if you don't have a guy that's going to do something special, in my opinion, what's the point of taking a risky catch to get five extra yards of field position? Just yeah. do the wave the hand and let's get our offense out here and let's safely transition the ball yeah. into our now offense's on. hands. Not an angle all, right. all right. Uh, all right. Well, we will close out today then. Uh, appreciate you guys for sticking around. Ryan, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. Be sure to use that dollar deal. Uh, to get in for your first month of access over at the Wolverine. Like and subscribe for Ryan Van Bergen. I'm Anthony Broom. Uh, We will talk to you guys again soon. Uh, Thanks for listening.